Welcome to Real Estate Radio Live, an informative and engaging podcast discussing everything you need to know about the world of real estate. Your host, Joe Kachera, provides you with insight and guidance on how to buy, sell, finance, and invest in real estate. He also offers real estate tax management strategies, new construction advice, home improvement tips, and much, much more. And now, to guide you around the world of real estate, here's your host and Real Estate Radio Live team leader, Joe Kachera. Welcome in. This is Joe Kachera with Real Estate Radio Live, the podcast series. As we continue, however I should say, begin the week here, we are rolling through. Kicking off 2017, we will continue to work hard at uh, delivering great content, information to you. The focus is not, you know, really hasn't changed since we started the show uh, almost seven years ago, and that is for us, Real Estate Live, the radio, the podcast team now is to provide you with information, education on the help, uh, really help to have you become more wise uh, and financially aware of what you're doing in and around real estate. The goal is not to have you become an expert because that's what we feel like we're here for. We want to be the experts in financing and Mike on the real estate side. And so we'll take care of that part. But we what we want to do is make you a more educated consumer so that you feel comfortable. You know the people to go to. You have a team. You have a group of people that you could trust in making these big decisions in and around real estate. Before we get started, and Mike and I are going to chat a little bit. We have some a couple of good topics for you today. Just a reminder, if you need anything in the way of real estate, uh, be sure to contact Mike. You could do that a couple of different ways. You can email him, Mike, at reradiolive.com, or you could text or call any questions you have for Mike, 408-630-0101. On the flip side, if you need help on financing with a purchase, a refinance, maybe you just need to some time to go over and some ideas of what you should do with your mortgages or finances. I'm here to help you with that. You can contact me, Joe, at reradiolive.com or 408-838-9060. All right, Mike, we're back at it here, huh? We're back at it, back in the saddle. <laughs> Must be a new week. Let's do it, yeah. We're doing it. Today we're going to... Uh, as we always like to do, Mike's going to give us a little update on the market in the Bay Area, um, some of the potential things that are going on, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what I call, you've heard this before, but every couple of months I really like to discuss alternative financing and some things that come up in in the way of financing. There's trust, there's uh, different ways to get money. I think a lot of people, unfortunately, when they're retired or if they don't have a traditional job, sometimes like they get a, a little like paralyzed. Us. Yeah, like us. <laughs> if you don't have a, like a real job, if you don't have a real job, that's a good point. <laughs> what happens when you have a real job? I don't know. I've never you have had to ask one. somebody. <laughs> uh, but if there's situations where little people get a little par- uh, paralyzed because they think, well, gee, I don't have a job anymore. But what I'll talk about is income is income, regardless of where you get it. Now it may be a little strange, but we will uh, we will discuss that as well. You might have to explain your income a little <laughs> bit more true. to the underwriters. <laughs> That's right. And income has to be documented. Just remember that when I say income's income, it does not it cannot come in the form of cash, of cash paper bags, <laughs> stacks. Here's Brief a briefcase, case, yeah. Joe. <laughs> a briefcase of cash, which, as the Italians know, happens every now and then. Right. Just kidding. <laughs> no, it's all good. As long as there's some good. You know, maybe some imported olive oil or maybe yeah, some yeah. good meats next to the briefcase. It's a different story. That's a totally different story. It's exactly a different story. <laughs> All right. So uh, why don't you give us a little update on the market, Mike? I know that here we go. We're coming on. You know, this weekend's the big Super Bowl. I know yeah. there's a lot of people in general in the market that kind of, you know, we have some good weather coming hopefully a little bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, with a combination of that, and let's hope it's a good market for um Getting some more inventory, huh? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, we always, I'm sure people that have been listening to the show have heard, you know, they've heard me or you say this, I don't even know how many times, that the Super Bowl is going to be the, you know, yeah. that's that's the, that's when it starts. That's when the really, yep. the selling season starts. And, um, you know, we're not going to, I've been telling some, I'm working with a few buyers right now. I don't work with a ton of buyers at a time just because... Uh, you know, you want to focus on and work with the the right buyers, yes, and no and doubt. so the ones that I ha- you know I'm working with because I'm more on the listing, but the ones I'm working with, I really got to keep engaged mm-hmm. because there's just nothing out there, and and you really you know, and there's not a whole lot to choose from, and um, 
you just got to let them know. Like I showed them some graphs, and it's hard to do that on a podcast, but I can yeah. send them to you if you guys are interested. If you look at the you know historically over the last three, four, or five Januaries, mm-hmm. it's just a natural progression. You know, really, Super Bowl ends the 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 holiday season, yeah, I guess you would call good it. Point. Yeah. Um, it's the last time people really have a party for a while. It's, you know, so, um, we're going to start seeing it bump up. It's just inevitable. Although this year it's even lower inventory than it has been the years past. I think the last time we talked about inventory mm-hmm. on the podcast, you know, we were under 750, like 730 something, Amazing. I think it was. But now we're up to 772. So we're bumping up. Um, I doubt you're going to see a lot come on this week because who the heck is going to have an right. open house on Super Bowl Sunday? Uh, it's just not going to happen if you're, I mean, a hundred plus million people watch the Super Bowl. <laughs> so I yeah, think okay. uh, you probably, I mean, you can always have open houses on Saturdays, but there's just not going to be a lot of activity yeah. this week. It's just natural. So now we're at 772, uh, almost 600 single families, almost 200, 191 mm-hmm. townhouse condos. I actually took a look at the uh, multifamilies, which we haven't talked about for a while, which is a really hot product for uh, investors, mm-hmm. you know, especially um out of the country investors, especially from Asia and those areas, really like multifamily because of the rents and right. whatnot. I mean, there's only 40, around 40 active properties in the entire county, Santa Clara County, uh, two to four units. So duplexes, mm. triplexes, and fourplexes, just not a lot. And then when you get a five plus, which as we know, takes commercial financing, you only have 18 in right. the entire county uh, for five plus units. So it's pretty amazing yeah. what we're seeing. Um, you know, there is going to be more inventory coming on. It's a, so we wanted to talk about this yeah. is like, yes, um, before we got on the podcast is, you know, how do we really know? I mean, it, what if nothing yeah. comes on and it's just, so besides the fact that it's a, you know, there, there's a trend showing it, mm-hmm. there's, there's data, uh, the really where you get that knowledge is on the streets, mm-hmm. as we call the mean streets right. of, uh, <laughs> the mean streets of, uh, my office and the mean streets of just, you know, the realtor community, that's where you find out the info. So I think I said it the other week. I was at one of the tour meetings, which you get a lot of info at. And one of the home inspectors that does mainly listing mm-hmm. inspections said that his listing inspections have doubled in the last couple of weeks, wow. which means a lot of agents are having their own inventory mm-hmm. come on. Uh, I mean, I know personally I have four or five listings coming up after Super Bowl myself. Mm-hmm. So. I mean, even in my office, we talk about it at every office meeting about who has what coming up, and there's just going to be a lot uh, yeah. coming on the market. So, Yeah, I think so, and this is always good. This is one of the we- reasons we hope that you stay tuned and you you stay in touch with the podcast. And um, it's continuing to grow and keep spreading the word, by the way. Uh, if you get a chance, go on and give us a review. We always love the reviews. Let us know what you think. And um, so on the inventory – Mike, I would guess that this is going to be good for both buyers and sellers, right? Because the buyers are kind of bent, you know, kind of pent up frustration. Where's the inventory? Yeah. I want to make a decision. What's going? To, what's happening here? And then theoretically, if you if we have more on the market here in the next thirty to sixty days, you're probably going to have a good market for a seller. Yeah. And then you know you're going to make the buyers happy. So I hope we're in a situation where. Uh, where it doesn't happen usually where you make most everybody happy. Yeah, you probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> it's never it's never easy, Joe, is it? <clears throat> no. I, I would say it's and buyers are going to be. I think the the fl- the flurry is that the, yeah the flurry the flurry of mm-hmm. action is going to happen really after Super Bowl because you have buyers trying to get in before interest rates go up, which you can talk about. Right. Um, and you have sellers trying to get properties on before there's a ton of competition as far as listings right. go. My guess is that the flurry of activity after Super Bowl is going to be—it's going to be yeah. pretty interesting. Yeah, and uh, you know we'll see what happens. What are to see? So, what I'll say is, as we finish up this first segment here in just a minute or so, is that what this brings me to, and Mike and I talked about it actually, I think a few weeks ago. We may have addressed this uh, topic is for those the, for those buyers or potential buyers, or you think you're a buyer. If you're smart, you're working with Mike or someone as part of the Real Estate Radio Live team because. We would recommend those in the real estate. But if you're not, seriously, get yourself quali- approved. And we did, we did uh, mm-hmm. I think I did this last week, and you and I have talked about this several times, Mike. But make sure you are underwritten approved, not, mm-hmm. not pre-qualified, not you think you are, not you talk to your <laughs> loan officer and you think you yeah. get an underwritten approval so that when these homes do start coming on the market, yeah. the serious buyers are ready, right? Absolutely. You want to be as 
prepared as possible, especially when you're dealing when you're dealing in a multiple offer mm-hmm. situation and you're going up against other people that are more prepared, possibly you know, more prepared than you. If you work with me and Joe, you're going to be prepared. But, you know, if you're working with someone else, you need to be as prepared as possible. You need to be in the the right situation. You need to be ready to compete mm-hmm. because it's competitive. And again, we're talking about Silicon Valley. Uh, I, I can't talk on, you know, other areas sure. of the state or the country, but that's the way it is right now here. Do you think, uh, Mike, that uh, I guess we'll see again, you know, it's been really tough. It's been kind of frustrating I, I know for the first time home buyer, I know in Silicon Valley, first time home buyer profile takes on a little different profile than maybe someone in Missouri or Idaho or something. But yeah, but seriously, someone who has an FHA loan, totally qualified, you know, but they're mm-hmm. putting three and a half, five percent, ten percent down. Um, that it's probably still going to be a bit of a handicap, right? It's going to be a bit of a handicap because. Not because you're, they're not qualified. Right, exactly. It's really going to be on how you sell it to the seller okay. and the listing agent that it's just another loan. Yeah. Because, like I know, like if I get an FHA loan and it's with a, a reputable mm-hmm. lender versus maybe there's another offer that has a conventional loan sure. or something, <clears throat> I know just through working with you and is that it's just another loan and if the lender and if it's underwritten and they're ready to go it's it's going to be right. fine but it's not everyone in the business understands that right. and not every and most sellers don't either right. when they see that bigger down payment they think differently right. so really you know i kind of tell a lot of buyers this it, it is about the buyers about their qualification it's about their pre-approval letter their down payment it's about their story the emotional mm-hmm. story but it's not always just about them too. It's about how good of an agent you have and how good they are at selling that story and that loan to the listing agent and the seller mm-hmm. is super important, especially in this area. Now I started and I know we're coming up against it, but yeah. I started selling in Sacramento on two thousand and eight when FHA loans were like they were <laughs> rampant. You know, they were yeah. all over that's that's all you saw. Yep. And so it's a little bit different now. You just have to sell the story differently. I guess. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? It's true. So That's yeah, very true. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We come back. We are going to discuss alternative financing. Speaking of being pre-approved, ready to go, we're going to talk a little bit about how you could finance purchases uh, and not have the traditional job. My, some of it may surprise you. Mike D'Ambrosio sitting along Joe Cachero. will be back with you in just a moment. For more information on today's program, visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Hi, this is Joe Cachera of Real Estate Radio Live. Thanks for tuning into our podcast. We are your go-to resource for all aspects of real estate, including buying, selling, refinancing, building, and legal and tax advice, and much more. You can subscribe to Real Estate Radio Live podcast on iTunes and Stitcher to listen to an engaging discussion about anything and everything real estate. So make sure you get our app, RE Radio Live, in the iTunes store to follow the show. Welcome back to Real Estate Radio Live. For more information on today's topic or guests, just visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Again, your host for today's edition of Real Estate Radio Live, Joe Kuchera. Welcome back in. Joe Kuchera with Real Estate Radio Live, the podcast series, alongside Mike D'Ambrosio. Today we're chatted the first uh, segment or topic we talked a little bit about the market mike gave us an update of what's going on with inventory what he thinks uh, anticipates going to happen over the next couple of months hopefully it'll mean more inventory on the market i know there's a lot of buyers with pent-up anxiety out there going well, <laughs> can we get those homes on the market so we're going to try to do our part and help that cause uh now we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about what we uh in our kind of in our industry alternative financing and what that means is real quickly before we kind of go through this checklist is this would be what I would say traditional kind of conventional financing. And we could just put that on the table first is let's say you have a W-2 income earning job and it's real simple. You make X amount a year and it's real simple to qualify. Those are simple. You know, here it is. This is what I make. What can I qualify for? Here we go. Get approved. Get your purchase or refinance. 
Then you have someone that's a business owner, and we deal with that a lot here yeah. in Silicon Valley, right? Corporation. Yeah, corporations, and all partnerships, K-1s. We could go into, but these are, you know, Michael, we call traditional income and streams of income where people make money. You might even be a business owner, and you don't collect a paycheck, but you, you know, get X amount of money. Maybe the corporation pays you. Maybe you get right. bonuses. Maybe you have a partnership where you get paid out by K-1s and all these different, so those, you know, we deal with all the time, and some of them are a little complicated when you get into the tax returns. But the bottom line is those are what we would call tr- kind of traditional, conventional financing. The unconventional or untraditional would be kind of the follows. The real estate agent? Yeah, the real estate <laughs> agent. <laughs> which, is always uh, a, which is always in a weird position. Or people that are independent contractors, yeah. it's like you want to write off as much as possible, mm-hmm. but... And, and but that's going to count against your income. Yeah. But it's then it's like a double-edged sword. But then when you want to go buy a piece of property, then the underwriter's saying, "Well, you don't you don't make as much as mm-hmm. X or whatever." So it's, it's kind of like a weird it's a weird position to be in. And that brings up a good point. And I'll say before as we talk about this, Mike, that brings up a really good point. I deal with some people that are that um, real estate agents, business owners. That as Mike said, what happens is you make good income. But let's face it, when you're self-employed, you want to take advantage of tax laws that you could do, and that's Mm -hmm. wonderful. I think everybody should. But if you anticipate a purchase or if you anticipate that you're going to need X amount of income, I've had some people call, get their CPA in the line with me, and go, okay, Joe, I'm looking at buying two investment properties Mm -hmm. next year. What kind of income can I show before I do my taxes? And that's smart. Yeah, that's a good idea. Because maybe you're not as aggressive on your write-offs. Maybe you do something different on your Schedule C. You do some things that you know will will hopefully allow you to qualify. So, these are things that's the that team really concept. You're talking yeah, about. the team concept is really Absolutely. important. Um, so, untraditional would be I'll give you an example. Someone's retired. Maybe they get Social Security income. Right. Maybe they get pension. Maybe they have a combination. Maybe they have. You know, we see a lot of stuff, Mike. We see, you know, someone might get a couple thousand month a month from Social Security. They may get four or five grand a month from a pension. They may be drawing another two, three grand a month from investment. Yeah, an right? IRA or mutual yeah, funds exactly. or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and and let's face it, untraditional income would fall in this category. Right. Let's say someone is not working, but they have a bunch of rental properties that are kicking out good yeah. income. Well, that too. Right? That's a big. That's a nice thing. Yeah. <laughs> so these are kind of untraditional, conventional income. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. The the one thing I want to throw out right away is don't be afraid to get on the phone or, or get a meeting, certainly in person with me or Mike or anybody that you trust, to talk about these things. Because I think a lot of people, they're like, oh, God, you don't have a job anymore. I can't do this. You'd be surprised. And that, <laughs> yeah. The first thing I would do is, you know, dispel that myth. Um, we were talking about a little bit about another topic. But don't ever think that just because you don't get a traditional income from a W-2 or you're not working anymore, uh, you can't show enough income. And that's the message we want to get out today. And I'll give you some examples. Again, you know, the way we look at income as an as an investor, Mike, and as a lender is income is income. It's different income. That's all. Yeah, right. But it's still income. So if you have a qualified IRA, and let's say you have a million and a half or $2 million in that qualified IRA, there's a formula they use and say, okay, if I take $5,000 a month from this qualified IRA, how, how long is it going to last me? Well, it'll last you the next 18, 19 years, mm-hmm. right? So we have a formula where at least if it lasts at least five years, you have to show that, um, and you could use that as income. You could use Social Security. We talked about rental income. Now, that comes into play. The difference in rental income, you have to really be careful of. Some people, again, will take advantage of write-offs and schedules. Yeah. So right, some of that income is offset a little bit yeah. for tax purposes. The other one that I see is uh, partnerships. We see that. And we have to dig deeper sometimes. Let's say someone's retired, but yet they invested in, in a business. And they're, they're making several thousand dollars a month on, on past investments or partnerships that feed through their tax return. So there's a lot of that that takes place. The other thing that I see less often, but it does come up every once in a while in the Silicon Valley, surprise, surprise, <laughs> you'll have this. They have this couple recently. You know, they're in their um, early 50s, right? They both hit it pretty big with high tech companies. They have five, six million dollars in the bank. They're like, you yeah. know what? We just we're just going to take some time off, figure out what we're going to do next. And oh, by the way, we want to we bought a piece of land and we want to build a house, mm-hmm. but we don't have a job. 
So what do you do then? So there is a program for specifically people like this that are not 59 and a half because that's what you have to tell you have to be to draw, you know, your income off yeah. IRS qualified programs. So what we do with that, Mike, is someone that's less than that age that has the money, there's a program that's called asset depletion. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. So then there's a formula and I don't want to bore people with the formula, but there is a formula and you do have to make, depending on how much, let's say a person needs in order to qualify, Mike, they need to make $10,000 a month in income. So then there's a formula if we take all their assets and then, um, you know, do this formula. And if they have enough in their, in their investment accounts to, again, it's usually a five- to seven-year period is what these people, if they have enough to, to actually live off showing that type of income on a monthly basis, then we could do the loan form and they show it as income. Does that include stock options and what? Like if they have a lot of vested in a company, will you be able to use that as a part of the? <clears throat> That's their, tricky. Um, yeah. If if the stocks, if you could exercise them, and if technically they're not locked up, then yeah, yeah, they could use those. Okay, got it. Yeah, if they're still locked up or they're not due to release yet, then you can't use them. I'll tell you the other thing that's interesting, and and I won't again. I don't want to get too complicated, but. We see a lot in the Bay Area, we see people getting income from restricted stock units. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. RSUs, you hear this all the time. What, Joe, can I use RSUs? Years ago when I heard it the first time, I was like, well, is that a disease or what is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you might think so, yeah. yeah. So, it, it, but this I would say, I would argue it kind of is if you have all of your wealth tied in, up in those. And that's, that's, a, good that's point. something we've talked about. I, I want to touch on that in a second, but go yeah. ahead. So continue. Yeah, so that's kind of a summary of the, the kind of an unconventional, untraditional mic. You know, let's say someone's retired. They're taking some time off work. I'll tell you, this one comes up too. You know, someone's on disability. Yep. Right? Yeah. I've seen that before. And, and, you know, they're not that old. They're on disability yeah. for some reason. They're collecting disability income. They have investments. There's, there is a number of different reasons. Um, I'll tell you another one that came up, and this is not that uncommon. I had a, um, a lady that just went through a divorce. She stayed home, and she raised the, raised, raised the kids for the first 16, 17 years. They got a divorce. Part of the divorce was that part of the agreement, I should say, was that she was going to ha- get the house in the agreement, right? But here's, here's what they stipulated in the divorce decree. They said, okay, you could have the house, but in the next two years, mm-hmm. you have to be able to take your ex-husband off the loan. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. So then she couldn't qualify. She, she hadn't worked in 18 years. Yeah. yeah. So now she had to go out and find a job. And so thank God we were able to help her. Um, we did ha- come up with a program. She was in, she was back to work for a year. She was on the clock. She only had six months or so to get this done. And if she didn't get it done, she could lose the house because that was the agreement. No one was going to give her income because she wasn't on the job two years, number one. And she actually, this was, a, um, it was technically, it wasn't a permanent job. Thank God that we had some alternative investors. We took care of it. They allowed the fact that she was on the job for wow. just a year. Interesting. And we got her financing, temporary yeah. financing. The rate wasn't that great, but she was totally happy. Got it done, it yeah. served a purpose. Yeah. Her husband came off the loan. Huge sigh of relief. Yeah, and She was wow. super happy, and it's great to help people like that. So these are the types of things. You and I are dealing with some trust stuff right now, potentially. Yeah, revocable trust, These are all things yeah. that are all kind of... You know, twisting and turning in the wind. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, that's the world we live in, though, right, Joe? Yeah. But I, I would say I want to just go back real on just a little side note about it. Yeah. We have, work with a lot of people in the tech industry, mm-hmm. and they have a lot of wealth, their wealth and their you know assets tied up in just strictly stocks of yeah. the company they work in. And we've talked about doing seminars on this and mm-hmm. whatnot. But you know, if you you got to be careful, it, and it doesn't just have to be stocks. If you have all of your wealth tied up in in a, I don't know, mutual fund or one mm-hmm. thing, you got to diversify a little bit. I would say the only thing, you know, if you just own a lot of real estate, that's probably the <laughs> one asset. And I'm not just saying that because I'm no. in real estate, true, but though. if you owned a lot of real estate, that's not necessarily a bad thing other than if the market completely went in the tank. Mm-hmm. But the fact is that if you have a bunch of rental properties and that happens, you're still getting rent. So other than that, if you have your, your income and your assets tied up in one you know, in stocks or in something mm-hmm. else, just be very careful and learn to diversify a little bit. I guess that was my the point I wanted to make good on, point. on that. So, Yeah, no, it's very good. A real quick story, speaking of that, I laughed when you said that all in real estate because my neighbor is one of those, you know, 
fortunate guys. He'll tell me all the time. I'll say, "How's it going?" He goes, "Joe, I just I feel lucky every day." So real quickly, his his grandparents invested in a sixty some unit apartment complex in San <laughs> yeah. Francisco like sixty years oh ago or God. something, right? In oh, a huge yeah. warehouse. Well, by the time they passed away, went on to the parents, and now him and his I think his brother and sister, three of them, inherit. A 60-unit apartment complex owned free and clear in San Francisco. Can you imagine? Let me just say this. As we, Itali- <laughs> as we Italians like to say, forget about it. <laughs> so as you were saying, yeah. I mean, if you were fortunate enough or you were smart enough, right, whatever, you, whatever, however it happened, yeah. that is um, a cool way to make some income. Absolutely. <laughs> forget about it. <laughs> if I had that, i say forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> So these are, uh, just as we wrap things up here in a minute or so, these are, we wanted to throw it out there. We'll discuss about this about more the next couple of weeks. And the reason why I think it's important to talk about this, we'll do more in detail, is that we don't want someone out there, Mike, that's thinking, God, I'd love to buy a second home, a beach home. I'd love to upgrade, but I don't think I can. And so we're here to help answer those questions. And that's really the part of the message today. Absolutely. Just reach out. We're always, we're always here. So. Always here to help. All right, as we sign off today, remember, uh, do us a favor. Give us a review. Go to reradiolive.com. Go to iTunes. And uh, until next time, have a great afternoon. Take care. You've been listening to Real Estate Radio Live. For more information on today's program, visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Subscribe to our podcast. Discover more at reradiolive.com.